Hey, I think you you guys both have similar kind of background for some reason. I think uh, maybe you also did the same thing. What uh, with you know, you know one of us is a trendsetter. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like you have more painting. So obviously you should be the one who set the trend, right? It so wasn't a, it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> well, Dan, my kids just they actually love me, so you know they just give me art. So I'm mean, <laughs> ready to put it up. Hey, everyone's love language is different, Dave. <laughs> Right. Um, so I was I was talking to uh, Dan and and um, and then I was throwing out a question uh, because I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs on a on a regular basis and what I see a challenge uh, largely is about the scalability aspect. Right. So you you start and then you get some traction. Then what? What next? People are not familiar with those territory. So uh, do you see similar challenges in your own surroundings or the kind of startups that you meet? Do you see similar kind of challenges? You know, it's interesting. I, I For me, I see more of the challenge. I guess the people we come across are, you know, because Slingshot Ventures really focus on the early stage. We see the people that are struggling just to um, really develop the product, you know, they so they'll, they'll come to us and usually they're at that idea stage and um, so it's just about how do I, how do I take this idea and then turn it into a product that's good? How do I get it moving? And that's, I feel like where a lot of them are stuck, you know, they're not sure if we, you know, do we need to raise some money or a lot of them have some money, but, you know, maybe not enough to really, um, you know, do anything crazy. Um, but they're in that spot where in order to get money, you have to have something. So how do you do that? And I think that's where... To me, that's the challenge that I see people running into is like they, it's almost like they're at that very basic point and they want to get to that uh, next level where they've got enough where they can show something where they can then get the bigger money. Um, but I do see definitely, you know, I think the ones where they have done a little bit and they are, they're at that point where they have gotten a little bit of traction, but um it's not enough maybe to sort of power them by themselves. Like you said, you know, they don't have, they might have some customers, uh, maybe they're not paid customers yet, or they have some paid customers, but it's not, not enough to, you know, sustain themselves or not enough to reinvest in the business to get it to the next level. Um, and so definitely, definitely we see that, um, you know, I think the answer to what, what you do then is, <laughs> is different for every person, but, um, definitely that's a, that's a struggle. You know, sorry, I think the, um, you know, we're kind of, Dave and I are going, kind of going through this. We've, we've been fortuitous enough to meet some other people who, um, are kind of in a similar position where they're building foundations for startups and they all have a little flavor that's different, right? The whole venture studio thing is kind of a, um, it's a new mechanism, I guess you could call it. That's kind of really blown up in the last 18 months. I think at least from what I'm seeing, um, cause when Dave and I originally started looking into a studio model, which was over a year ago, um, there are really only like four or five that we could see. And now we do a, a quarterly call with like 15 in the region, you know, from Atlanta, um, Indianapolis, um, some Southern states. And we spoke to a couple of people out of the Valley, um, last time around, but <clears throat> one of the groups that we got introduced to out of Nashville, they're all about growth. They're all about, you know, how do you go from those initial dollars and, you know, going, okay, we have something here, but then following through on the product market fit and then moving from market development to sales. And I think that the biggest challenge and i think dave can attest to this in the early days of slingshot um the product development side of slingshot ventures is if you lose focus then you're you're really in a hard way and what i mean by that is for a tech services company you have smart people who do technology things and if you know tech whether you're coding in you know this language this language or this language it really doesn't matter if you understand how to build things right the the, the syntax is just um it's just it's just a new way of doing it so if you understand the underlying 
um, what's the word? I don't want to say philosophy, but the underlying uh, way to architect solutions within you know a stateless environment like the internet, then it's semantics after that. But when it comes to growing your business, if you don't have a focus of the two, one or two things that you're doing, it's very easy to get sucked into the 15 other things that you can do just to make money. But the problem is, is that you may not be an expert at that one thing. And so all your attention goes to this thing that you brought on and then your attention goes to how are we going to deliver it? And then if it breaks, then your attention is still going to how are we supporting it? And the whole time you're You've, you've fallen out of the boundaries of the thing that I'm good at, the thing that I'm driving towards. So I think initially it's got to understand that where you fit into your market. And then the second part high level is now let's go there and not worry about these ancillary things that yes, we could probably make a lot of money, but what's the opportunity cost of doing that? What's the potential risk of us taking on this, you know, this maybe one time outlier that's going to net us a bunch of cash, but could, slow us down for the main driver behind our business or what it ever, you know, what it is we're trying to accomplish. I think that's the big thing, at least again, high level, right? Cause I, I speak to that from the slingshot experience, because when we were a team of five and you know, we grew to a team of 20 in three years and we had to turn down, we had some, you know, we had some kind of soul searching questions, you know, we wanted to build a company where, People manage their own schedules. They all could work wherever they wanted as long as things were getting done and they were available for client meetings. And we had one client that said, we want, I want eight of your people in my office for the next year. Hmm. And we're like, yeah, but we don't work that way. And he said, do you know how much money this is for you all? And we're like, yeah, but then everyone's going to quit. <laughs> like, because, <laughs> you know, they came here because of the promises that we laid out. So we had to have the conversation. It's one thing to say no, but it's a, another thing to understand while you're saying no to kind of reinforce that paradigm of this is what we're trying to build. This is where we want to go. And after we told him no, he never called me back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you regret that though? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would say absolutely not. No. Nope. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it could have been a lot of money. We could have got to a, you know, Dave could have bought his Porsche earlier. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of the day, what do you have after that? When everyone's like, I don't want, I don't want to work on it. I'm like, now I'm doing what everyone else is doing. Yeah. And so, so what is what is important then? Then if you look at the uh, the things that you mentioned, you mentioned about the focus. Um, Focus is one aspect, and how do uh, up and coming entrepreneur really think about what they are good at? Right. So, uh, if you say, "Okay, I'm good at maybe designing," maybe I should only focus on the things that matters on the design level, right? And if I'm really good at coding, then maybe I should just focus on the coding and 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 maybe build the best architecture possible in terms of coding, or use the best possible uh standards or best practices there right so so how do you how do you advise those people like who are just up and coming and they also are a a, a single person entrepreneur in their own rights and they have to do everything now you know even though they are not good at marketing they have to do marketing even though they are not good at you know i don't know writing an email or as such then they have to do those things um so so how do you how do you advise those people who are up and coming Go ahead, Dave. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the bad news is you're probably going to have to do a lot of stuff that's out of your comfort zone. I mean, it's just how it is. And as an, part of being an entrepreneur is just kind of powering through and getting out of your comfort zone and learning something new. And I think that's where the passion comes in because, you know, I think if you're really passionate about what you're doing, you know, let's say you're, you're a programmer, but you're not a salesperson. Well, you're never going to be a, like the, the top salesperson ever, but you should be able to sell what you're passionate about. I mean, I think anybody can sell what they're really passionate about. Um, so that's one. But uh, the other part of that is, you know, I think you, you have to, when you're searching for partners or, you know, um, way to build your company and structure it to your point, you know, absolutely. You, you're an asset in some way or another. Everybody has a, a skill, um, whether it be, if, like you said, if you're the programmer, then, uh, hey, maybe you can build a product that's an MVP and maybe it's it doesn't look very good because you're not a designer, but 
now you've shown a potential investor or another potential business partner that you're really serious about this. Um, maybe if you're in sales, um, you can go talk to a lot of potential customers, do a lot of market research, and that's a huge value uh, if you're trying to recruit a technical co-founder um, or if you're trying to get an investor, it's again, you have something. Uh, and again, if you're a designer, sure, design the thing, make it an amazing design and maybe you stop there, right? But now all of a sudden, if you go to, you know, if you want to find a programmer to partner with um, or go to an investor, you have something. I think that's the key. You've got to commit in my opinion, a huge amount of efforts um, to get going. It's, you know, I think there's a lot of, there's too much, uh, in my opinion, what I see anyway, a lot is I created this idea, then I created a pitch deck, then I did a very small amount of research, and now I'm trying to find investors. I just think that's a bad way to go. Um, I just, I don't know how often that really works. Uh, maybe if you're if you're somebody who has already been successful and have been an entrepreneur several times, then I think you, you can definitely get away with that. But I think if you're like first time entrepreneur, uh, you need to, you need to show another level of commitment. It's gotta be something. Um, and so I think using your own skill is a great place to start, whatever that happens to be, whether it's and if you're marketing, hell, I mean, you can put together a splash page, um, show that you can get people interested, um, coming to a site or to an ad, you know, something there's, I think everybody has a certain skill, um, that they can use, um, uh, in some regards. I think it's just not, don't get intimidated by what you don't have, um, and, you know, empower yourself to use what you do. But like I said, the still, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone no matter what. So just prepare yourself for that. Yeah, I think, he, I think to add to that, I think Dave's right. Like, you know, in Buddhism, they call it edge work. You know, like you put yourself in the unknown. Like I've been in the last 10 months, been really trying to uh, embrace the idea of charging towards my doubt because I know that I'm smart enough to overcome. I'm smart enough to do research. I'm smart enough to learn. And I've had enough experiences that I know I can overcome things I didn't think I knew, you know, didn't think I could do beforehand. So like charging through that doubt and then recognizing what you're good at and what you're not good at. Like I'm, I am not good at tedious tasks. I get bored. I don't want to run, you know, I want to be kind of multiple things going on. If I have to do a sustained focus thing and work through something, it becomes just somatically. I'm like, Oh, I got to get out of here. And I think all of us have that. And so we know what we're good at and we know what we're not good at. And so recognizing that I think is very helpful to Dave's point about passion, passion projects, help us kind of transcend that somatic feeling of I can't do this because you go, I want to do this because you're tied to this, this kind of overarching idea or belief about this thing you're trying to build. Right. And I think that if somebody is going to start a business because they want to change the world or they want to change a, a, an aspect of their community or, you know, their lives in some fashion that is outside of making money, I think those people are in a completely different experience than someone who comes up with an idea just to make profit, right? Because we, we've, how many cases have we seen of the artist who creates music because they love it? And as soon as they get that big deal, they get writer's block, right? Like all of a sudden they're no longer the artist, but they're the employee of the record company or what have you. And I think that it's fine to go out and build a, a business to solely make cash if you understand that's why you're doing it. And, and you're comfortable with that. But if you're going out there to do a passion project that turns into a way, you know, the thing that we all chase, right? Or we all want to do, find something that you love and make it your work and you never work another day or whatever they say. I think those are two different people going after the money versus going after the thing that I like to do. It looks different to them. It comes across a lot easier because they don't see the challenge in front of them because they're operating from the place of I, of the vision. I want to make this happen. But if you're working from the place of I need to make money, that looks a lot different because now here comes all the stress with what happens if I don't make the money. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the passion project person goes through that experience because they don't care that it's secondary to what that is they're trying to accomplish. And if the money shows up to continue to get them to the next level, awesome. But if it doesn't, then they find a different way to get there. Mm -hmm. So I think it's um, today's point about the passion, those people, cause I, and I bring this up from the perspective of us 
interviewing founders and talking to them about what they're doing. And there's a couple of people that we really liked because they put themselves in a very difficult position of not knowing anything. And they, they spent six, seven, eight months learning this thing they didn't know to build this crappy piece of software a prototype and the uncomfortableness of putting it out there and getting feedback. It's like, you want to work with that person because they're resilient. They've got fortitude and they've got a lot of drive and we believe in their, we believe in them. It's less about the idea and it's more about them. And then we've had other ideas that were really good ideas, but then the same conversation they're going, so you think in six months we could find someone to run this? <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, I guess like, good luck. Like, I don't want anything to do with that. Like, I don't think that person's going to necessarily stick around when it gets hard because it's going to get hard. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and, and you, you, I mean, Dave uh, mentioned about commitment. Um, what I, what I see as a commitment is like what uh, you know Dan also mentioned is, is like, um, it's, it's very, very uh, easy to to say, oh, I'm committed to this during the course of an interview, and and then you know you 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 can also be, you know, asking the right questions and receiving the right answers. How often are you thinking about, oh, you know, we made a bad decisions of, of, of selecting a, a one of those entrepreneurs, which otherwise you shouldn't have, you know, how often do you regret that decision of, of picking one versus the other? Well, I don't know if we've really had that experience just yet. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we've got two companies that we're working with now, you know, yeah. one's a platform from pharmaceutical and the other one's a mobile a mobile uh, healthcare product for surgeons. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, I, Dave, you may want to jump in here, but I, for me, I think some of the people that we've talked to that we decided to go further with, it is, I mean, with what we're trying to do, it, it's, it's altruistic in, in some regard because we're not like, okay, we want to make a, you know, $3 million by the end of 2021. It's more like, hey, let's work with some cool people and do some cool things and see what we learn. Hmm. You know, and yeah, we okay. want to make a million dollars or whatever, you know, if that money shows up. But if somebody wants to sell a business in three years, great. If somebody wants to run a business for 20 years, all right, that's fine too, as long as we feel comfortable with it, I think. Um, but I think they, for the most part, it's really, Let's see what we can do. Let's see what experience that we can have. Let's see who we can meet. Let's see what we can create. Let's see what we can build. And then, yeah, I think that that kind of changes the the outlook for us, at least for me. Well, yeah, and I, and I think just the other part of that, we, we want to work with people we like and respect. So um, that changes a little bit. You know, we when we first started doing Slingshot Ventures, we were going to raise a massive fund and, and have that be part of that. But we didn't want to be... Um, pressure to distribute money or take on deals. Um, you know, we wanted to be able to say no as many times as we felt like it, um, you know, go longer between deals. And that's, that's, that sort of drives that from the standpoint of, you know, we're, we're a bit more picky, I guess. And when it comes to the entrepreneur that, you know, we, if we don't, I don't want to work with somebody I don't, don't like or respect or both really. <laughs> so, um, you know, I feel like when we, when we partner with an entrepreneur so far, it's been, you know, we're, we're in it together with them. So it's, it's more so not so much them failing as much as both of us are failing together. So um, I think that changes the perspective a little bit when you're, when you're talking about, it's not, we're not their boss, you know, we're their partners. So, um, you know, we want to find somebody that has that. Um, and yeah, you definitely to Dan's point, like we're not, we're not deep enough into it to come across that person where we, we thought they were all good and then <laughs> maybe they, uh, maybe things didn't turn out and definitely that can happen. I know, I've, you know, um, that's a thing, that's a real thing, but I think that's in that case, uh, it, you, that's going to happen. There's no way around that. So, um, well, and adding to the, the, the thing about the fun, I think the other part of it was, it's really, we, I don't want to, I want my loyalty to lie with the founder and not necessarily um, have to go back on that because I'm beholden to an investor. And so to Dave's point about partnering with them, it's like, you know, over the course of Dave and I's career, 
you know, we've had little failures within the, you know, the grand scheme of what we were building. And so you're like, oh man, that sucks. That could have been great. Let's move to the next thing. And I think to some degree, it's kind of like that with what we're doing. So if you partner with somebody that you truly like, respect, and who, who's, you know, kind of done some things, you're like, man, this person's putting themselves out there. Yeah, if you fail, it's like, cool, what's next? You know, what, what, what's the next thing that you want to do? Because the other part too, I think it's, it's really hard in at least what I'm seeing. I don't know how many times I've talked to a founder or somebody who has an idea. And the first thing they want to do is talk about an NDA and a hundred percent of their idea. And I'm like, dude, I don't want your idea. <laughs> like, the idea is the easy part, pal. Like, you know, implementation and growth is it's, that's where it gets difficult. So yeah. I, th I think like, there needs to, we need to evolve into more of a collaborative approach, I think, from a founder's perspective. And I think that maybe some of the investment dollars and the VC money, and like, maybe that's where this defensiveness shows up because the founders are always the last ones to get paid. Mm -hmm. And it's like their baby, right? Like fail fast in some of these organizations sounds really cool. And, and until you realize that the thing that you're killing fast is like someone's baby they've been working on for three years, right? This idea of blood, sweat, and tears. And you're like, you guys destroyed it in five months. Like, okay, awesome. Like, okay. You know what I mean? Like there's gotta be some sense of grief in that experience. And so yeah. this, this idea of, of a founder, like, okay, like what do I want to build? And this is where I've started from. And this is what I want it to mean. And okay, what am I not good at? And who should I bring to the table and bet that and go, okay, cool. We're all in this together. And like, let's move forward and collaborate instead of, you know, well, you got 51% and I can't, you know, do anything and voting rights. And it's like, that's all the, the it's all made up stuff, mm -hmm. you know, to keep us, make sure we don't get screwed over or whatever, but it gets in the way of progress and collaboration because you're too busy worried about your 51% of zero, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like it's going to get in the way of maybe earning your first dollar because you couldn't get off of, you couldn't get out of that place of focusing on the cash potentially yeah and and <clears throat> when you look at the 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 various startups that comes to you um do you look at the particular let's say a technology as such maybe they are into ai or maybe they are into uh, the blockchain or maybe they are into other forms of new innovations right are you uh, or maybe health startup right so are you looking into any particular niche at the moment like okay hard health startup it is interesting let's listen to these guys do you look into those variables as well or you're like okay any any random startups we have we are prepared to listen well i think we listen we definitely have a right now we're we're b2b i'd say that's where our strength is you know we're um just because dan and i both of our careers that's where we've had a lot of experiences b2b uh tech products um so that's that's where we're probably listening more intently that, and, uh, as well as I will say, you know, industries where we have more experience, we also have like a lot of healthcare experience. Um, so that's another area where B2B healthcare, those in fact, actually are, are both of our, uh, both of the, uh, organizations that we have working now are in fact, B2B healthcare. Um, so we do, however, listen to all the other ideas, but it does factor into, um, you know, how far we're going to put ourselves out there. And also we, we are very honest people. Um, so if, if somebody comes to us and is like, you know, this is what we want to do, we'll look at it and say, you know what, we don't have this strength. Um, this is something we're really missing. Um, it could be like a consumer marketing play that, um, or like a, you know, a consumer social network, we probably wouldn't touch at all. Just stuff that's so far outside of what we do, you know, it would just, it's probably a quicker no for us. Um, that being said, if, you know, I think it's, if the entrepreneur is compelling um, and, you know, for us, the idea is compelling and they are bringing maybe some of the pieces that we don't have. I think that's where it gets a lot more interesting. Um, so it just, it's almost like a puzzle when somebody comes at us and we know we have these, you know, six skills over here. We know we're looking for these four. Um, if they come to us with, all four of those, perfect. It's a fit. Or if they come to it with, with maybe only one of those and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're missing three, then all of a sudden it's like, well, this isn't really, 
you know, we'll tell them either, look, we're not a fit or we're going to try to probably bring somebody else in. That's something we've actually done um, with one of them we're looking at is saying, you know, there's a hole here. We really need some expertise, uh, let's say, in this consumer marketing or whatever it is. And so that's part of the deal as well. If we're going to take this on, we need to make sure this hole is plugged here. Um, so it just factors in. Um, yeah, yeah I, was, I yeah. think Dave summed it up pretty well. I mean, you could have a great idea that costs, you know, $80,000 to build. Then you got to spend $8 million on marketing. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like in, in, from a B to C play, the, the, that's a very finicky kind of thing, right? Like how do you lead adoption? And if we were experts at leading adoption, well then I'd just be writing books and doing seminars and making millions, right? But I think... <laughs> I think the uh, the challenge for any time we talk to somebody is to Dave's point, like, okay, in this engagement, who owns what, who's doing what, and what's the risk associated? So if you bring a social platform to us, it's like, yeah, risk is pretty high. I mean, we've never built one of those. I mean, it's just tech and semantics again, but the context is different. We don't have experiences in that per se. So what are the pitfalls and what are the commonalities amongst all the other platforms that failed that we may find ourselves in, right? So uh, understanding kind of that risk level and the tolerance that we have for that risk related to the people that are at play and what we're trying to do, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, because for us, I think we're, we wanna be shepherds of the cash, <clears throat> you know, that's why we, we follow the lean methodology. Let's build the smallest thing, understand what we're building before we write any code. Do we need to pivot? Where does it fit? Um, and then land that first client. And then what's next, right? How do we con- treat, How do we continue to, to increase our value to the, to our customers without you know breaking the bank because of those unexpected things that are going to show up? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, you mentioned about lean, um, and how. What is the timeline that you give to any entrepreneur? Like, let's say they are they are looking at uh, they are they are trying to create a product that are within your expertise or within your experience, and you you find that that is something that you would like to pursue further, and and then you know what is the timeline you want to give it to the to the entrepreneur in that regard and say, hey, we we need to be able to you know at least get out of uh, the MVP. Uh, the at least within x amount of time is there is there something like that you you still want to apply or it is it is like okay we will we will learn we will evolve evolve we will iterate and all those things like you know which where do you want to where where do you want to put yourself yeah i mean i would say that the timeline you know generally because we you know at slingshot we do this all the time and we we know that you know typically to get through our lean process and research and design and pivoting and stuff is you know a two two to four month process but i think on the slingshot venture side and and really even on the slingshot side it's we don't like focusing on the timeline um just because you don't want to get into this um well these guys can do it in four months these guys can do it in three these guys can do it in five and then that factor in the decision i don't think any of that matters in the grand scheme of things it's you know, are you going to find the product market fit and what length they're going to go to do that? And if you shortchange that and say, um, well, we got a timeline to meet, so let's, let's just stop there. You know, I think that's a, a, a red flag as far as, you know, it's just, it's different from the business. I think you've got to take the time to, um, like you said, it's, it's an evolving, it's an iterating thing. As you learn more, you need to, um, you may learn that, you're way off, um, <laughs> of course. So you may have to start a three or four month cycle all over again. It may take yeah. another three or four months. So you have to be open to that going in. So I think, you know, it's it's fine to give somebody an idea of a timeline. You know, usually it takes us whatever, two to four months to get through this uh, research design process. However, that's not really what we're concerned about. It's almost, you know, there's just these di- different phase gates I would say that we go through. Uh, one of the first ones is, interviewing potential customers um, and follow quickly or at the same time as analyzing the competition and what's out there. Um, And so that gives you a good basis to start. Um, 
but you may find in those interviews that um, you got the wrong customer, uh, the idea is not resonating, the problem you thought you had is not a universal problem. It's maybe only a problem that 10% of the market has versus 80%. Of, you know, you, you just you find out so much, and I think you just have to keep evolving until you get to a point really even at the interview phase where okay wow we found something now we feel really good at now let's go to the design phase um then you go out there and you test the design it's like you keep iterating again testing it with customers and until you find a spot where wow we're really we think we got something now we'll move it to the build phase so i think it's just important to to really focus on the outcomes uh not not the timeline and and that's something we try to get our consulting clients at Slingshot to do. It's harder in the consulting world because it's driven by a business or a stakeholder who says, I want this done in six months and I'm not spending more than this. Um, but, you know, on the Slingshot venture side, um, it's a bit easier um, because, you know, we're all after the, I think it's, it's more apparent that, you know, this is what matters is <laughs> we've got to get that product market fit. Yeah, I think it's funny when you have uh, your, the consulting clients, it's like, you always go back to the, if I put nine women in a room, like, you know, for a month, I'm not going to create a baby. Like it's going to take <laughs> long as you to take, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And if you try to speed that up and, you know, then what do you get at the end? It's usually something that's half baked and, you know, misses the mark. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, because I, I always find a, a timeline or, a, you know, or, or, is more of a guesstimate, right? So you are you are making a guess based on your previous experience, perhaps, or or similar kind of experience. But it's not it's not the same thing you are developing, right? At the end of the day, and you are always um, developing something new, um, and it has a different set of challenges, right? So so you know, like like um, Dave mentioned uh, that you know it's it's a different kind of challenge when 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 you are in a consulting background and you are, you are reaching out to your client and say, Hey, guess what guys? Like we thought it would be done, done in six months, but we need further six months to, to get to where you want to be. How do you, how do you take that approach? You know, you know, uh, based on your own experience, how do you, how do you deal with those kind of things? Well, if you're six months into a project, if you're halfway into a six month project and you realize it's going to take you another six months, they should never hire you again. <laughs> like somebody missed something, right? Like you didn't do enough legwork you didn't ask enough questions. Um, I think for the most part, it's like, again, I, I'll use the analogy of building a house, right? You kind of understand how long it takes to lay the foundation re regardless of how many floors you have, right? Now, maybe the scale of the foundation is going to add a couple weeks because, you know, it's a bigger footprint, but you start putting on floors and adding walls and things like that. All, those all relatively take the same amount of time. See, so understanding the, the, the complexities that come with a specific build, I think is super important. Um, but the, um, it's, it's really understanding the expectations out of the gate what are we trying to build and again setting a, a timeline that kind of makes sense generally you kind of come in a little below or a little above but if you're communicating i think that's the key right in any relationship if you're communicating and realigning expectations about things as you move forward then generally when you get to the end delivering a piece of software no one no one remembers the pain points because everybody just wants to get to the end. And so if it's not like, you know, a huge multiple miss, you know, months and, you know, thousands of dollars or whatever it is, then I don't think you really get into any kind of trouble areas. But if you just go out there and fire from the hip and, and we've had projects too, we put in bids and, you know, we're, we're kind of the middle of the road and they go with a low bid and they end up getting something delivered above the high bid. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm like, how the hell did you do that? Right. It's like, the, it's the three things, right? Like I want it fast. I want it cheap and I want it high quality. It's like, all right, pick two. 
you know, and you got to kind of, you got to kind of stay with that. So I think it's important for anybody when you're engaging with somebody is understand what are you trying to build? Where are we currently, right? Do the best can, like you said, it is a guesstimation, right? It's the hardest part of software development is get as estimating how much time it's going to take, but it's that communication. It's not trying to hide, like you're partnering with somebody to build something, you know, at least we are. I mean, I know companies, I mean, Dave and I have encountered where we got to go in and fix something that somebody put a million dollar bid on and they delivered nothing. And I'm like, God, I would have delivered nothing for half a mil. It saves us some money. Like, I think it's the communication aspect, man. And we're all human. We're all humans. We have lives outside of like, just we saw with Dave and the crying toddler, like things are going to pull us away. We're not, maybe not going to be at the best or top of our game, but just got to keep that in mind. If you're working with people. And, you know, people have other things going on. And so communicating when things change or impacts to a timeline, I think, are of the utmost importance when it comes to delivering something. <clears throat> right. They don't know if you heard that question over the uh, screaming child. <laughs> no, I, I probably, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, no. I was, talking about I was... how do you handle, you know, missing the mark on estimates and timelines. Yes. So when oh, you're dealing yeah. with your clients, you know, so, you know, for example, you know, you, you said, okay, maybe, you know, we will be get the, uh, this thing done within three months. Right. And then, and then that doesn't happen. Right. So that's, that's where the discussion was. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just to add Dan's point, I like Dan, what you said about, um, you know, if you get to the end and it's success, you do forget about, Oh, that took four months instead of three. Um, and the flip side of that is, you know, if you deliver it on time and on budget, but it's a total failure, guess what? They're not going to like you. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. who cares, right? Okay, great. You know, it's a, it's a very fleeting time and budget. You know, we all try to get in within time and budget. That's what, um, and on the slingshot side, I say we're, we're so honest um, that, you know, sometimes that works against us because, you know, we tell people we're going to do things the right way. Um, you know, we're going to do more work up front to make sure you don't waste your dollars down the road. And a lot of companies will come in and just, you know, they're hitting the quickest way we can get to the end. Uh, we know we can put less resource on it, less expensive people. It doesn't matter. You know, they'll, they may win the business, but in the end, the project's not going to be a success. And that's, that's what, what we care about. And I think I wish more people would be more outcome driven. You know, it's just, it's, and some people are, those are the people you find and you want to work with and you want to have a long-term relationship with. Um, and really, honestly, it's once you get past the first one where, you know, you're extremely successful and they see that and they see the thoroughness, then it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you keep on going down that route. So, um, but yeah, time and budget is always a, it's always a fun thing. So it's so, like relationships, man. <laughs> you know, it's money, you know, it's money I've wasted on my wife. <laughs> like, if every time something didn't go well, or we missed a deadline, or I did something, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you forgot to buy her a phone or something, you know. So, yeah, well, I think Dave's right. It's all outcome, right? Like, yeah. and a lot of times we don't have that. I know, you know, uh, it, we're conditioned. We're conditioned to have those kind of client vendor relationships and here are the boundaries. I mean, yeah, we have some clients that even have like, you're not allowed to accept gifts, right? Mm. Like lunches and stuff. And that's because people are like, listen, man, give me the deal. I'll fly to your family four to Florida for a week. And like, that's a real thing. Mm. Uh, I've had a CIO tell me that. He's just like, Dan, they'll just come in and ask me what kind of TV I want. I'm like, really? Could you get me one? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and it's, it's to them to some of those organizations it's just the cost of doing business and it, but it, the person who accepts that deal like, they probably don't need to be there because it doesn't necessarily mean the person they're working with is the best person for the job or they're going to deliver the best outcome mm -hmm. and so i don't know it's just a it's a crazy mixed up world <laughs> like it's you know what, what drives you to make your choices um you know, what are you trying to do, regardless if you're running a team, running a company, or starting a founder, or at starting as a founder? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, slightly on a different subject, I want to sort of, you know, take you, uh, go back to your own experience, and then um, maybe you want to sort of, you know, think about the technology's evolution, 
and because you are into the tech sector. So I want to sort of, you know, know from your own perspective, how do you see the evolution now? You know, we've seen the likes of, you know, the, the 4G and 3G and 5G and 5G network. And, and, and then also on the other side, like we are using uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and all those new things. Uh, how do you see that side of you, you know, when, when it comes to technologies? Um, well, you know, I think for me, it's just, it's like the next evolution of uh, advancing a business through some kind of tech product, right? Like, I don't know, back maybe 15 years ago, there's there's a lot, of, a lot of companies, a lot of industries that could benefit from a very simple, let's take something you're doing manually and let's automate it, or let's take a better digital version of something that was an older digital version and do that. And I think now it's, you have all these uh, amazing technologies that are more mainstream, you know, voice, AI, drones, uh, whatever, whatever you want, pick your thing. And um, it's to me, it's driving the next advance of products where now, um, you know, I think to a lot of stuff, if you want to have that big jump in, this is going to be a real improvement to the industry or really help us out. It, there's a good chance it's using one of these uh, leading edge, uh, you know, uh, higher tech solutions. Um, it, there's still stuff out there that, um, you know, I think there's still opportunities where even just um, taking something um, and designing it better. I think that's also an underserved uh, area is like just take something and rethink it. Uh, you see that now with like insurance. You see all these new insurance mm -hmm. companies coming out, uh, Lemonade, um, Beam Dental, all these places that are taking this legacy sort of thing and just adding tech to it. Um, they're not even really some in some forms are using more advanced tech, but in those cases, they're really just to me, it's almost design tech driven from the start. And that's really the difference. Um, um, and so I think there's always opportunities there where, you know, you have a legacy industry. And if you just say, wow, tech is so much farther now. What if I just restart this tech first, design first, um, user experience first, all of a sudden that's a business. Um, so I think that's something, the other flip side is that you don't necessarily have to have a high tech solution to solve a problem or be the next great startup. Uh, sometimes it's just rethinking uh, and aggressively uh, taking a new approach to uh, an older industry. I, I think that's a, that's a good question. It's one that I've been kind of like knocking around for months because you think about like back in the day somebody was trying to make a faster horse and then they created a car right like and it's <laughs> so uh, you know what I mean it's like so outside yeah, of what anybody yeah. was thinking about. like yeah. when you think about like you know quantum computers mm -hmm. you know like you're getting into particle and wave and being able to maintain both and whatever i don't know and i think right now once you get that computing power up and running then it's like okay well what's the distance and what's that do right like where does that put us you're talking about 5g and 4g and all that other stuff i mean still that hardware is you know i mean it's i just feel like we <clears throat> the next wave of tech is going to hit us we're not even going to know yeah. like just computing power i mean i think i was reading something about how they're maybe able to save data into water droplets and quartz and you know all these different storage devices and it's like yeah man who knows we're talking about web technology and you're you know you want to store things in a rock like you know what i mean like you're like who knows what it looks like and i think it's awesome i think it's awesome from the perspective of us being able to create these things you know maybe even tapping into some stuff that was present you know thousands of years ago that uh, we just kind of lost sight of for whatever reason but um no I, I think it's i think it's incredible i mean even just from like 20 years that the web's been a thing you know going from like this hey let's create kind of your client server applications in the web with this archaic crap technology and then you finally like start to take advantage of what the web is yeah. and you build architectures around what the web is um and it, it's awesome right and it's continued to unfold but then you throw mobile in the mix and what's you know being able to it's all the mobile technologies and you know like you're talking about the bandwidths and having this kind of open network across the globe well shoot if you can pass information around a variety of ways well how do you receive that information what does that look like so whether it's ai blockchain any I mean, who knows man i mean i 
somebody's out there rolling around in a car and we're still thinking about horses. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, uh, I think the cool thing about it is you have to ask, it's still about solving a problem, but I think you have to ask, can I solve this problem? Maybe every two years, ask the same question because all of a sudden the answer changes that quickly with the advent of new tech. I mean, if you look at the, the horse, uh, well, there's a problem. These horses are smelly, they get tired. They're not that fast. Um, okay, is there anything that can solve this? Nope, check again in two years. Nope, check in. Oh, wait, now we have this, you know, we have an engine we can add to some, something. We have wheels, we can, well, you know, it's just, I think with all this new tech, it poses new opportunities. So you just have to continuously reevaluate it's kind of like block, Blockbuster. Why weren't they Netflix? Why didn't Blockbuster become Netflix? Well, because they they, they stopped asking the question, how can we do this better? How can, now this is available. How can we yeah. do this better? They're just like, okay, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and slightly yeah. improve it, but not things have changed. So how can I go back to the core problem I'm solving, which is maybe providing entertainment for somebody at home and what what how can I solve this problem most effectively? Um, so I think you have to keep you have to be up on the new tech and um, just continually asking the same question <laughs> because there, there could be a, a different answer every year, every two years. Um, well, I think you bring up a really good point about the blockbuster thing, right? Cause even, the, I think it was one of the guys that started Amazon or um, Netflix even talked about being laughed out of the boardroom at blockbuster. And like he remembers that, right? They're like, no one's going to want a DVD in the mail or whatever it was. And it's like, yeah, yeah player. You missed that boat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the same thing with the Sears catalog, right? Like, why aren't you all Amazon? And yeah. I think that it's it's interesting. It's the paradigm of the person running the show, mm -hmm. right? That guy at Blockbuster that laughed could never, ever think that he would do that. So mm -hmm. his people can't do that. I think it was like five or six years ago talking about broadband when broadband really hit the scene in the U.S. And like the biggest cable company in the country was like, Oh, we're kind of surprised that uh, people were cutting the cord. You know, people were getting rid of cable and they just want high, high, you know, high speed broadband. I'm like, yeah, why do you have a job? Like, why are you running a big cable company? When you see this like, yeah, or maybe he just wanted out, right? He's got a golden parachute. Get, get me out of here. I didn't know this was going to happen. But my point is, is that it takes that, you know, you think about the, my kids, you know, they're eight and 10 and they look at the world in a completely different way, not just because they're eight and 10, but because they have access to information at their age that like, hell, who knows what kind of kid I would have been if I would have had the internet at eight, the things I could have explored and learned about and, you know, whatever, but playing, they're able to access anything they want to know. And it's all right here in this device. And because we don't have cable and they have Netflix and they can watch shows on demand, they never see commercials. Yeah. Like when I ask them, what do you want for, you know, what do you want for Christmas? My youngest, she's like, well, we haven't been able to go out the shops. So I don't know, <laughs> you, know, you know, because we don't really go anywhere because of the whole pandemic thing. And she's yeah. like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, God, man, thank God we shut off that cable. Cause <laughs> here's the list of the junk I want this year. So anyway, so my point is, is that they get to, they're going to have a completely different way to look at solving a problem because they're like, wait a minute, you know, kind of like the mobile product we're building for surgeons. It's not mm -hmm. for the guy that's there now, right? It's for the generation behind them. It's like, you want me to use what to do what? Why? You know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You can always, you know, you may have something like an algorithm or whatever, and, and now new things enable you to to now take that vision to life. So that's, uh, there's always opportunity. And it's a dance point. There's always these companies that get going a certain way and they've got momentum and there's politics and there's just, there's so much there. Um, yeah. It, there's always opportunity. Always. It's Yeah. It's that like human beings get in the way, you know, mm -hmm. our, our minds get in the way. This like, where do you, where does your identity lie? And I need to be the one to own stuff. And I need to be the one that looks, you know, like I did it, whatever. And it, it just really gets in the way of progress. I think in a lot of cases, because you're too worried about assigning ownership instead of just going out and building something new mm -hmm. and it's such a it just stifles innovation man i think when you know and i think for for us in the city of louisville you know there's i, I was talking to a uh, an investor um, a couple weeks ago talked about how he stopped and 
investing in Louisville because he, he kept meeting what he called um, turf builders. Mm -hmm. So other investors who would just, you know, they're trying to establish their turf, you know, they want, because if there's no one else in this community offering money for startups, well, then he's got the say, he's got all the power, so to speak. And so now he's come back after 25 years and he's looking to do, you know, just kind of reassessing. And he's like, I'm starting to meet a whole lot of people who are more open to collaborating. And it's not about turf building. It's about collaborating and seeing what we can build and, you know, things like that. And I, I think that that I, ideally you'd like to go that route, right? Like, can we all just maybe collaborate more instead of competing in, you know, these early stage ideas? Um, and just see what we could build if we work together instead of, you know, kind of getting lost in the, you know, the social construct of ownership and, you know, being the owner. You know, I want to be the, the next Mark Zuckerberg. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to be in front of Congress, you know, I don't want to testify. Like, screw that. I don't want to be Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like, yeah, I could try to. <laughs> yeah, right. But it'd be cool to build something that people liked. And it'd be really cool if they didn't do, you know, use it for the things that they use it for, too. But, yeah. you know, again, weird world. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I got plenty of soapboxes I could stand on. <laughs> you, have, you can't tell. <laughs> One thing that um, I was I wanted to ask you guys, it's like when you when you look at the ideas, right? So obviously, you know, this 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 answer could be different from from both of you or you know it could vary from different entrepreneurs it's it's like you know sometimes entrepreneurs say that you know uh, when the idea comes to you uh, you should also look for ideas that has been proven already that's one side uh, on how you validate that the idea is actually going to work maybe you want to add your own element make it better and then make it work or you want to sort of, you know, bet on the idea that has not been proven. Where do you want to sort of, you know, lean towards? Where should the founder lean towards? No, uh, yourself. Like, for example, if a founder comes to you and... and oh, says, I see. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, th I think, you know, one of the... It's, all, it's like I mentioned before, one of our early steps is always to look at potential competitors or... Um, not necessarily direct competitors, although some, because sometimes that doesn't exist to your point. Like it's, it's the idea is so new or so far out there that there is no concept of anything like this. Um, and you know that, I, well, let me take, if there is competitors, that's, first of all, that's not a bad sign. You know, I think some people say, oh, there's somebody out there. Okay. We shouldn't do. And it's like, well, wait a minute. There's somebody out there. Uh, they're new. Uh, they're growing. You know, it's like, um, like pet insurance, you know, we have a client that was pet insurance, they got acquired and there was about 10 or 15 other pet insurance companies. And, you know, they saw that in Europe, 40% of people have pet insurance in the U S about 3% have. So pet insurance companies kept springing up and they, all of them were growing like wild. So, um, so on one hand, you know, if there's competitors that are growing, that's not a bad thing. Sometimes that's a good thing. Um, how saturated the market, that's something you want to factor in there, but um, if it's, if it's some idea that's so far out there that there's nothing even like it, um, yeah, that probably is, um, probably is riskier because usually, I mean, the, the world is big enough that almost like if somebody's thinking of an idea, probably 10 other people are also thinking about that same, probably hundreds are also thinking about that same idea. And then of those hundreds, maybe a few of them have already started doing something with it. Um, so if you've got an idea that's so far out there. Uh, to me, it's not a, it's not a something that we would, um, I don't think it would factor in, honestly, I'd still just look at, um, let's look at the problem you think this is going to solve, let's, let's validate your assumptions. Um, let's look at you as an entrepreneur, why, why do you, why are you, why do you think this idea is like, is that because you have a background in it, you have an understanding of the problem, it's personal to you, you know, it's still, to me, it's still all the, all the same things. Yeah, I think it also opens up a, kind of some other questions too, right? <clears throat> I mean, I think you, you're right, Dave, about your kind of hypothesis and the assumptions for sure. Uh, but at the same time, you, then, then you got to really, I think the competitive analysis, obviously, it's there's no competition directly, but there's probably plenty of indirect competition. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, like, has Netflix killed hobbies? <laughs> 
You know, like we have this library of, of movies and things that we never would have known about before because it didn't get to the theater or whatever. It's sitting in my living room, hanging on the wall. And anytime that I'm bored or I want to do something, I can just go in and get sucked into a series that I never would have watched at any other time. Well, what does that done to hobbies? You know, same thing with like athletics and, you know, in the United States, you get college athletics and it's a huge thing. Well, as soon as these kids started getting phones and big screen televisions, they stopped going to the games because it's more comfortable. You know, that experience is different. They don't necessarily want to sit and watch a game in the way that, you know, we did when we grow, we were growing up. So I think if a, a founder came to us with a brand new idea, it's like, cool, much like the cars, right? What's the infrastructure needed for a car versus a horse? And is it there? Is it going to limit us? Is it going to limit our ability? Or are we going to have to take on another facet of the, uh, of the auto industry, right? Or bringing this car out. I think like early on, like the, the law for jaywalking, which is basically crossing the street without a crosswalk. Well, the reason that law exists is because auto industry saw that people were getting hit by cars because people were just crossing the street when normal. Well, they saw that that could hurt the adoption of an automobile mm -hmm. because it kills people, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know? And so they're like, how do we get around this? Well, let's create a law that says you're not allowed to cross the street unless you cross at a crosswalk, which should minimize the amount of deaths, which should make it easier. Let's put the onus on the human being, right? Let's it's that's walking, not the person in the car. So again, it's what is the indirect implications of bringing something new to the table and is there something else you're going to have to prepare for in order to make sure that the adoption or the success of your product can happen and i think you know some of that's guesstimation right like we talked about earlier but it's something that, that's, that has to be considered because if you to your your friend's example about the algorithm and having connectivity right it's finally here it's arrived well if you build something that's awesome and great is there something else that has to show up in order for it to be successful Mm -hmm. and some of that you can maybe kind of predict and others it might just be fun to explore and see what you come up with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and you know um there are things that there are great about technology like like uh you like you said then um you know you have access to the to the netflix and you know whenever you want you can watch things right and similarly kids are always uh, connected to the internet um and when i was growing up like you said you know i didn't have internet i was just happy with the radio and and then i would just listen and that would be my day right and, and then just playing outside and, and enjoying the nature and, and those kind of things how as a father and both of you are parents and i, I'm, I myself I'm, I'm a little bit concerned with with the way people are interacting with the internet and and is that a similar kind of concern you guys have, you know, you know, when, when kids are always connected to the internet? I mean, I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't like, uh, I think there's, um, to me, there's an immediate gratification thing. I think that's, yeah. I'd say the biggest concern I have is like, yeah. you know, you can get something always at your fingertips and it's too easy to be entertained. It's too easy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It just, everything's too easy. And it, and it, can you, um, do you have an appreciation for something for going after something that maybe is a longer payoff or, um, can you focus longer? Um, so I think those two things, attention span, uh, immediate gratification, those are things that to me are concerning. Like, is that going to be a thing? Um, and I think if your kids are on the internet too often and, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I think, I think you got to, as a parent, I think you got to limit that. At least that's my uh, parental philosophy. So, um, uh, man, this, I could talk for days on this subject, but <laughs> like we just had a, my wife and I had a conversation this morning because, you know, the pandemic, you know, we're kids are at school at home. And so we're having to deal with that. Thank God my wife used to teach. Uh, <laughs> but it's my daughter asked for the kids messenger app owned by Facebook. And I'm like, yeah, we're not going to do it. You know, like I don't have a Facebook account. Um, I don't have any social media except for LinkedIn. And mm -hmm. that's just because of work. Um, and so like to some degree, you got to kind of play the game, you know, the game that society says that you should play. And I think for our kids, it's, 
today's point, instant gratification and that kind of access is one thing. Um, for me, there's also, you know, the level of exploitation that happens, um, you know, turning kids into products, you know, they, they become the next wave of kind of the energy, you know, the, the, how you make money off of them. And that's the thing, the problem I have with the kids messenger app. I mean, as a business person, you know, that you build an app specifically for somebody under the age of 13, when they turn 13, you're going to want to push them to your platform, right? You've already conditioned them that this is the way that you do things. And I think it's really hard for us as parents because my daughter is rightfully disappointed because her entire class uses kids messenger app. And of course me, I'm like, I bet all the parents are using Facebook too. And that's a problem, <laughs> right? Like this idea of privacy and the idea of like, you know, I want to, I should be, I should have a say in being able to give it away. It shouldn't just be the default setting that I don't have any. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's really hard for a 10 year old to get that in her head because she just wants to talk to her friends and she has no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> um, but I think there's a reason why, you know, the executives in Silicon Valley don't give their kids the things that they build, you know, mm -hmm. the stories that we hear around the Apple products and things like that, because I mean, there's, I encountered on, um, I guess it was two years ago. It's like a group of PhD scientists on human behavior. They're consultants and their only job is to go into tech companies and make their products addictive. Mm. I'm like, that's a thing. That's their, job? Like, that's their job. That's what they consult on. I mean, they don't say that. They say, uh, we're here to uh, increase adoption and usage of your product over time. And when you read how they do it, it's like, oh, you're taking advantage of, you know, kind of the dopamine hits you get when you get a reward and, you know, the serotonin <laughs> hits when you get this thing. And it's like, they're just kind of gaming the system, which is fine, whatever, if you want to do that, right? It's up to us as individuals to be able to make those choices. And if my daughter, when she turns, you know, whatever, 18 and says, I want to be a cog in the machine and I want to be sucked into everything else that everyone else is, then okay, then she can make that choice. But hopefully, I don't know what your guys' thoughts are. It's like trying to teach them that this is the, like, I want you to be able to make a choice without being influenced by something that you don't even know is influencing you. And here's the reason, you don't want to get it now, but here's the reason why I don't want you to do it. You can still use FaceTime. You can still use Zoom if you want. Um, but it's just not, today's point, it's not as easy right? It's not as seamless for me, just like a button and I can see classmates and, you know, we can talk about whatever, but what is the, the overarching implication of that mm -hmm. is my question as a parent. And I mean, yeah. And then she wants to add friends onto the Roblox. I don't know if you, your kids play Roblox, but it's like, you know, rather than telling her what I want her to do, I'm like, tell me what you want to do. Tell me what you think, you know? We don't give personal information. We don't say who lives at the house. We don't share images. We like, those are the things I want to coach her on because I'm not going to be around her all the time. Yeah. Right. And I want her to be able to make a choice that I would support when I'm not around. And the only way to do that is to see what she's thinking when she's in front of her, instead of just telling her, mm -hmm. no, you can't. Right. We know what happens when you tell human beings, they can't do something and you don't give them a good reason why. They just do it behind your back, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, we're seeing that with the war on drugs and all the other things. So anyway, like, yeah, I think exploitation of children because there's people out there, the instant gratification is a problem too. You know, how do you, yeah. like Dave was saying, like, how do you, I mean, how adults have a difficult time with focus and anxiety and depression in it's tied to these social platforms. Let me compare my real life shit show to your highlight reel, pal. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and, and that all goes back to this drive for competition and the capitalistic society, right? Like, you're really special if you own this and wear this and do this. You're like, I got all that. I still feel like shit. What's the problem? Right? <laughs> and so there's a different there's a different way to answer that question. There's a different yeah. way to approach that. And, and I'm hopefully instilling some of those behaviors in my children, you know, things that I've been learning over the last five years, just about how do you increase your focus and how do you become more aware and how do you understand what's going on with your emotions and, you know, responding to situations instead of reacting. And I think that social media and those platforms short circuit some of that for sure. And yeah, they don't know what to do when you tell them to go play outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to love it, right? So I, when I was a kid, I was I was just, you know, hoping that my parents would tell me to go outside and play. <laughs> so, 
or so that was that was my childhood that's a reason like you know I, I'm, I'm really concerned and, and I see both of you as a parent and I thought you know that would be a good question at this particular time uh now coming back to this pandemic I'm, I'm kind of thinking as an entrepreneur you know you you would have had a different set of challenges pre-covid and uh now during the uh, during this crisis what are the challenges that you thought are unique to your situation at the moment? Um, well, you know, that's interesting. I think uh, to me right now, um, you know, on the, on the entrepreneur side, I think there's always opportunity. It's always about problems and, and there's really, you know, maybe changes what the problems are um, or what your focus can be. There's probably... I think temporarily there was sort of a block on funding and all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's kind of eased up, but um, I think on the slingshot side where it's, you know, I think there's a, there's a cultural challenge that um, as a business, you really have to rethink your culture because all of a sudden people aren't in the office. Um, you know, you may have been at work that's, that's like, man, we, we are such a great culture. Everybody's laid back. You can work from anywhere. You can work from home. Well, guess what? Everybody's working from home now. Um, you know, it's just, it's changed. It's changed the landscape of um, what, what is your company culture? What's that going to look like? How do you do that when everybody's disconnected? Uh, what does culture actually mean? Is it, um, you know, it has to mean more beyond uh, gimmicks or certain things you're doing or benefits or where you can work. So um, I think it, because now you have uh, more competition for, hey, this is an attractive place to work. Well, now everybody's sort of like, okay, cool. Um, you know, everybody's caught up. And so how do you, how do you continue to innovate on the culture side, I think is a, is a real thing. And how do you keep the connection of your team going um, when, you know, everybody's working together, but, you know, not everybody's working with everybody before they're in their office or seeing everybody. You know, so to me, that's an interesting uh, dilemma that we faced uh, at Slingshot. You know, we tried it. We did a number of things. You know, we had some social distant lunches. We have a weekly uh, staff call. Um, but it's still, um, you know, it's something that you have to reevaluate. These environments change. Um, so you think, you know, I'm still trying to, still trying to solve that completely. But um, just you have to rethink. I think uh, culture is a big one that you should be aware of if you're a, if you're a business owner that, Hey, this has changed everything. So how am I going to react? Am I going to keep doing the same things? What am I going to change? Um, how do I keep my employees happy? Uh, they're under more stress. So how do I relieve that for them? If I can, um, you know, they're, you got two working parents they are home with their kids Their kids can't go to school. Um, so, you know, as a business, if you're the employer, how do you help those people out? So I think that's just, uh, for me, it's just uh, one of the biggest things that you have to, the first step is just to acknowledge it and then say, okay, let me rethink about how, how am I going to attack this uh, cultural challenge? I think on an individual level too, you're, you, each, each of us is kind of tasked with that um, kind of assessment, right? Of what's important to me, you know, cause there's some people that can work from home and there's some people that can't, I'm kind of like the middle of the road, but I hit my limit like three months ago. Like, <laughs> like I want to be back in the office, right? Like I, like I enjoy face-to-face -face meetings and conversing with people and engaging and hearing about their weekends and sharing stories and you know, whatever, like, and so this is, it, I mean, it's purposeful, but at the same time, it's caused me to reevaluate and if anything to say, all right, well, this is, I know this is important to me. I can do it one way, but I'd rather have it this way, right? A hybrid. And I think for, for us, I mean, you know, Slingshot has been operating on a, like I said, work from wherever you want for a while, right? And some guys and girls would test the, uh, I'm going to work from home. And then after three weeks, they're like, yeah, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So it makes you wonder, like moving forward with companies, how do you balance that? You know, how do you balance the opportunity for someone to work from a space where there's other people versus somebody who wants to work outside of that space? And then also, um, you know, I, I think it's funny. We had a client back in like 2012 that when we said that we let our people work from home, they're like, well, how do you know they do anything? I'm like, well, are you angry? Because they're working on your project. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So 
it's like this idea that you're going to take adults who are going to buy homes and buy cars and raise children and you're going to bring them to work and treat them like kids. Like, aren't they the best to manage their own schedules and manage their own lives, right? And make work a part of that. And can they be more productive? And I think our experience is yes, they're a lot more productive when you let them do it from wherever they are, wherever they are. And if they're not productive, then it's not a good fit. It's not that they're bad. It's just not a good fit. You know, you need, you need somebody to manage you. You need somebody to give you rails and, you know, kind of tell you when you've done a good job. So I think on an individual level, it's what have I learned from this experience in being home? Yeah. Maybe I only want to work part-time because I enjoy spending all this time with my kids, Mm -hmm. you know, because I think for me, and my wife, we talk about it a lot, but, you know, when I was going to the office every day, I'd, I'd see them three hours in the evening, maybe two and a half, you know, an hour in the morning. And that's it. That's not a lot of time if you think about it, right? Through the week. Um, so now that I get to see them all the time, it's great all the time. Like, <laughs> uh, But it, it opens up another dimension, right? The dimension of parenting and the dimension of connecting with them. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to see what the impact it has on them, knowing that there's a lot of kids out there that aren't necessarily having a positive experience with this because mm-hmm. their parents are where they are and what have you. But we're fortunate in that regard. So society as a whole, I think, has been faced with a lot of questions on an individual level, you know, micro level and on a macro level. And what's Im- ultimately what's important to you? Mm-hmm. And could you sacrifice that, you know, that second salary in the house? to be more at home and more present with your kids, Mm -hmm. maybe. Or do you love your kids enough to want to spend this all this time? You're like, "Uh uh-uh, man, get me the (laughs) hell out of here. Like, (laughs) I got a barometer of how bad of a parent I am and I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's, it's challenging indeed. Um, And and it's, it's, it's really depends on, on person to person, uh, like you've said, and, and perhaps we are all juggling between our work and 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 home and, and our private life versus personal life and sorry uh, the, the office life versus the private life um uh you know i think dave mentioned about culture within the company um i'm kind of curious about how do you how do you see your own company's culture in that perspective or maybe can you elaborate further on how do you how do you Define your own company's uh, culture. Yeah, Dave, I'm going to hear this. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I'll come back to you. (laughs) Well, no, I I think it's um, the culture is one where it starts with the vision of what your company is. I think it always starts from that, like, because everything drives that. So I think for a time, people got carried away with, uh, I will call them gimmicks of this is my cool office or this is my cool. I'm going to send you some uh, blue M&Ms every month. I don't know, just like random stuff that people would do that is not, I don't think is really culture. I think it starts with what is your organization? What does it stand for? What are you trying to be? Um, If you're an organization and you're always trying to provide low cost software services, well, okay, then that's going to reflect on the people because you're not going to attract good people because good people don't want to work on crap. Um, If you start with, you know, this is a company where we really are focused on doing things the right way. Um, we want to be the best. We want our software to have a huge impact. Then you start attracting people who also want to work that way because there's a lot of places where it's, um, you know, just do this as quickly as possible or they don't appreciate um, doing things the right way. I think it's also about uh, listening and um, understanding your employees and appreciating their viewpoints. I mean, that's a, um, a huge aspect. So uh, again, this, this, this shouldn't be affected by COVID, right? If you're, um, you should be getting input from people, um, whether that's when you're hiring new people, you should be getting your input of your staff when you're going a new direction, asking people. I mean, I think that's a, you know, just uh, reaching out to them so they feel like they're part of what's going on in the company. Um, these to me are culture things, um, versus having a ping pong table in your office. That's, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, that's not culture to me. So I think it's like, what are your core values as a company? What do you stand for? And it's fine to have a core value that, you know, we want to be a place that values work-life balance. I think that's always been one of slingshot that, you know, we don't want 
We don't ask people to work overtime. You can work from home if you want. Be, get yourself comfortable. Um, <clears throat> you know, we actually have a unlimited PTO policy and just we don't really track that stuff. You know, it's like, hey, if you need some time off, take it. If, you know, if you got something to do with your kid, go handle it. It's just, I think it's just, um, so that's an aspect of culture that, um, again, it's not really COVID dependent. Um, so I think um, that being said, the other part of culture, I think, is you have to make sure these ideas are enforced, or I say enforced, um, uh, kind of cultivated um, continuously, because you're only as good as your last, uh, the last thing you did. Um, it's, I think you have to keep doing things. You have to keep getting everything that you want to be your culture is your values. You have, that has to be consistent day after day, year after year, um, for that to really be culture. So I think, um, all those things, uh, I've gotten off on a tangent, but like, <laughs> keep going, David. <laughs> great. I'm taking notes and I'm sharing it with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm trying to say is that uh, I think culture comes from the core values of who you are, uh, how you treat people, and where what's the vision of the company versus uh, kind of these fringe benefits or all these uh, little gimmicks you do to attract people. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I can't help but think that it's it should be less about like the culture of a business and more about just the community aspect of it, right? Because if you think about any organization, at least, at least in the U S like we got to work, right. To pay our things. And so we have this, um, I mean, you got to work everywhere, but my point is that in the, the United States, it's such a highly competitive field for getting good workers and the things that you're going to give them. And like, fr- like Dave was talking about the, these fringe benefits and, you know, we have a company in Louisville that at one point they were like, you know, you have video games and ping pong tables and all this stuff and they're getting the kids right out of college or whatever. And they keep hiring more people because they're so busy and they've got so much work and they can't do it. And then I've got like four of their senior level developers are like, yeah, I'm bored. I want to leave. I'm like, Maybe you're bored. I thought you guys were slammed. They're like, yeah, it's just all the kids work. We, and there's like this huge disconnect, right? Like, what are you, what are you trying to do? And so I think that for businesses, I mean, much like we're talking about with entrepreneurs, right? Like if there's a partnership that gets established, you know, like I'm going to come in here and do things for you. That's going to enrich all of us, the people at the top more so than anything. And you're in return, you're going to give me the opportunity to have the experience I want with my personal life and my family and things like that. Like I was reading about the company. There was a company out West. Dave, I don't know if you remember the accounting, I think it was an accounting firm of some sort where the, the guy that owned it said, all right, um, I'm going to dock my, you know, $1.3 million salary and I'm going to give everybody a pay raise to 70 grand. And, you know, all these true kind of business capitalists were like, oh, that's absurd. Why would you do that? And he threw out, I think he said it's been four four or five years since. And he just talked about their growth. um, How many people, it was, it was some really interesting kind of piece of information, like how many people were having babies um, no, no understanding that that could be their maturity and age, but how many people were having babies now that they felt like they could because they could afford it? How many people, um, how much, how many days a week were they taking off their productivity level, how happy they were. And like all these things kind of went up. And to me, like you built a community of people who were all looking at each other as peers instead of subordinates. Right. And so, and you have the opportunity and they, Dave cares about my family, not because he calls me every day and asks them how they're doing, but because he gives me an opportunity to spend more time with my family. It's a very indirect relationship. And, and I think that with people who are running organizations, looking at it more as a community, you know, in this whole idea of like, let me get as much as I can out of my workers so that I can then turn around and make as much profit. Like maybe that ideology is fading away, you know, maybe that's, we're moving into something different because you have to, right? Because it's no longer going to be about these giant corporate offices, right? Like if you can be more productive, having people working from home, well, that's going to cause a ripple effect. And I think a lot of ways that you handle your staff and that into your, your question, yeah, your culture is going to have to change because it's going to have to support this idea of remote workers. And how do you create that level of community remotely? Yeah outside of just sending them a paycheck because now today's point 
floodgates are open, pal. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Everybody's allowing me work from home and I don't necessarily need more money to do it. You know? So it's, it's, it's really interesting dynamic and, and it's, it'd be interesting to see how it plays out over the next couple of years. Uh, one of the key aspects of culture I personally felt is uh, openness. Uh, what I mean by openness is not just about just being open to what you're doing, but also being open to accepting that your ideas are inferior to the, your colleagues, right? Um, or just saying, okay, your ideas is better than mine, right? So how often are you challenged uh, by your own colleagues in that perspective? Um, you know, we, I, I was... we never have any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Um, so you are safe now. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Uh, I'd say definitely people, if they have something, they, they, they voice it. But I will say this, though... Um, you know, we have a lot of introverts and so they may have a concern or something that they feel um, bad about or they want they want change and they, they won't necessarily, you have to pull it out of them. So it's a little bit, um, and I don't think that's, I think that's, it's more like a, it's a personality thing. It's just somebody that, you know, you might have somebody that's an introvert and doesn't like conflict. So they're, they're less, you have to pull it out of them. Um, and the hope is that you um, and it's interesting when you have somebody new first first working for you, you can see the, the cultural ties that they're bringing or just the, the thing and you, you have to almost work at them to pull them a different direction. So I think it happens over time. But you, yeah, you, you hope to have a culture where everybody just says whatever and that's, that's a part of it. But you also have to work, I think, on certain people to say, no, I want to hear that or tell me what you think or what do you think about this? So it's it's a it's a push and a pull. Um, so I think absolutely some people, uh, they def, you know, the openness is there and they feel that and they just, they just come to you and other people, you have to, you have to get them. <laughs> you have to get them to that spot. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's, you know, to your point, it's like, you have to create an environment of safety. So the turtle will come out of its shell. Right. <laughs> and I think that in order, a lot of times, in order for people to express a concern or a desire, you, you've got to let them know that they're going to be heard, right? And it's important to you. And that goes, like, with anything. I mean, it starts in childhood, right? Like, I let my daughters know I see and hear them. I may not like it, but <laughs> I see I see and hear them, right? And and giving them, I'm, I'm, I'm giving them a voice regardless of my, you know, my response. And so... Dave's right though, man. You're talking about an office full of techies. I mean, they just want to write code, right? I mean, it's an interesting dynamic because there is a lot of introverts that don't say anything, but regardless if they're introverts or outgoing, they still want their art to hang, right? They still want to know that the work that they're doing matters and it's getting put out there. And so, um, <clears throat> now I don't, I think in, in, in at least specifically to slingshot, I think that the environment's always been like, if you have an idea, man, and you think it's, you want to try something or go somewhere, Dave's done a very good job of saying, go do it. Right. It's the reason that the lean's a thing. It's the reason that we're an AWS partner. That was an initiative by an employee that said, Hey, I want to go have this adventure. He's like, cool, let's go do it. And then Dave paid for him to go to the AD AWS conference. And then he found a new job working with some cool people with some cool tech. But, <laughs> but even in that relationship, it wasn't one of, at least from my perspective, it wasn't one of, I mean, yeah, it sucked because it was a long-term employee, but they brought a lot of gifts, a lot of things to the table. And it just seemed naturally for him to flow into a, into a new role, working with some cool things that he wanted to do that he couldn't do where he was, right? He kind of outgrew the relationship. And I think it's, there's a level of maturity there that we could all um, kind of work to get to, right? Not taking those kind of things personal. I know early on, we used to say, if someone leaves, it's because of us, not because of them, because it, it makes us constantly stay in touch with what it is that we're doing um, and how, it, how we're working um, with the, you know, with the people that are there and making sure that they feel again, heard and seen and that they matter and, you know, kind of reinforcing that entire, um, that aspect of the culture. So if you've got this nurturing, open, 
environment, I can throw out my ideas and I can ask for new adventures and maybe I can tell Dave, I need a little more money on the side, you know, whatever it is. Right. <laughs> like, um, but it, it's, again, it's a community of people that are all trying to do the same thing and, you know, have good lives and do cool things. And, you know, so it's a lot that goes into it. And I think as soon as you go down, as soon as you lay some rigid pathways down, you limit yourself immediately. So definitely being open to that kind of stuff, I think is important. All right. Um, I think I'm just looking at the uh, clock now and I uh, think I've, uh, you know, thrown a lot of questions with otherwise I wouldn't throw because I found you guys very interesting. Um, Thanks, and... man. Thank you. <laughs> That's the best compliment I've gotten in like five years. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was it was it was enjoyable conversation, you know, for personally me as well, you know, you know, because like I said earlier, you know, it's important that I, I get to know the persons uh, when I'm talking to, um, not just from from what they're doing. I could I could just Google and find out, right? But then when I'm speaking to the person, then then I get to experience something more than what I can find in Google, right? So so I, I think this is what I was I was searching for as far as uh, the experience is concerned, as far as how you build your own companies is concerned and. What do you look for uh, in a company when you want to sort of, you know, uh, onboard new uh, ideas, right? So those kind of things. So uh, that's why I said, like, it was it was very interesting conversation. Yeah. Appreciate um, it. Yeah, I appreciate you reaching out and including us for sure. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful time. And let's be in touch. <laughs>